But I'll bet the Japanese didn't like it. Christopher Nolan put his own daughter, Laura Nolan, in this shot as the most graphic victim that J. Robert Oppenheimer sees, as his previously contained inner quantum world finally explodes into his outer atmosphere. After eight years of analyzing hundreds of films, including those of this filmmaker, I have come to realize that all filmmakers, at the end of the day, only know how to tell one story, their own. And the deeper story of 2023's Oppenheimer, the most recent Best Picture winner, is a filmmaker realizing the horror of one of his own creations, something that could have, in his eyes, ignited a chain reaction that would bring about the end of his precious world as he knows it. By the end of this analysis, I promise to reveal to you what that Christopher Nolan creation was, and I don't know if you're ready for the answer. I'm Eric Voss, and this is The Deep Dive, the channel that dives deep in the films we love to find the hidden meaning no one ever talks about. In this second year of The Deep Dive channel, I'm picking back up with three of the videos I made in the first year, and for the next handful of videos, I will be focusing on the films of Christopher Nolan. Oppenheimer is a film that finally won Nolan the Oscar glory that had eluded him for so long. But unlike other instances of arguably lesser works winning as the condolences for past overlooked masterpieces, for example Martin Scorsese winning for The Departed and not for Raging Bull or Goodfellas, Oppenheimer might be Christopher Nolan's best film. It's certainly one where he proved himself making a billion dollars with a movie that on paper should not have made a billion dollars. There's no superhero IP, there's no flashy sci-fi conceit. It's just a good goddamn movie. But I think the reason it struck a nerve with so many viewers is it's also Nolan's most personal work, an inevitable culmination of an innovator who is ruminating over his past creations. So while I broke down the film for the new Rockstars channel the week it released, we must return to it here for a fuller, proper deep dive into its hundreds of missable details and its chilling hidden agenda. What did Nolan create that made him feel like he has blood on his hands? Before the film begins, we see the Universal logo with its glowing globe, much like the surface of the planet seen from low orbit that erupts into hellfire in the closing montage. Nolan produced most of his films with Warner Brothers, with Interstellar being a joint venture between Warner and Paramount, but in 2021 that all changed. Like Oppenheimer boldly going against the Defense Department, Nolan publicly parted ways with Warner over the studio's decision to release their biggest films that year, including Dune, digitally on HBO Max. Nolan, as a huge proponent of theatrical exhibition, shooting on film, and fighting to death tech's takeover of the film industry with streaming platforms, refused to work with Warner on his next film and Universal outbid Sony for the opportunity. I only mention the studio drama because I promise it plays into my Nolan as Oppenheimer theory. It'll make sense. So the film opens with drops of rain rippling a puddle at Cambridge in 1926 as student J. Robert Oppenheimer, Killian Murphy, gazes down paralyzed with fear. Why does a puddle scare this kid so much? Well, this visual bookends the closing scene of the film when Oppenheimer will see these same types of ripples on a pond at Princeton and utter the famous exchange that this film centers around. For him, the ripples represent the fear of a chain reaction that defines his life, a ripple effect of quantum particles colliding with each other that could and maybe someday will ignite the atmosphere in an instant. We cut from this serene puddle of rainwater to its elemental opposite, a ball of fire ripping across a desert. Of the Oscars this movie won that included picture, director, actor, supporting actor, the Oscar winning editing by Jennifer Lame might be the most worthy of that statuette, as she so decisively cuts from what Oppenheimer sees to the violent theoretical world that plagues his mind of quantum physics that he knows are just a matter of time before the wrong hands harness them into apocalyptic doom. These macroscopic images of explosions and quantum particles should be bewildering to us, but thanks to the editor Lame always cutting from the right shot at the right second, we just instinctively know that these images represent Oppenheimer's subconscious panic and dread. Over these explosions, we hear some stomping. From the visual context, we assume initially that these sounds are a slowed down part of the explosion itself, but as the film goes on, we will recognize them as the stomps from the most pivotal scene, Oppenheimer's victory speech at the Los Alamos gym. And so we can look at every moment of his life as one step and stomp after another, leading to that inevitable moment of panic when Pandora's box has been opened. The opening quote is, Prometheus stole fire from the gods and gave it to man. For this, he was chained to a rock and tortured for eternity. This is a shortened version of a quote from Apollodorus that opens the 2005 book, American Prometheus, A Triumph and Tragedy of J. Robert Oppenheimer by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin. The full Apollodorus quote goes, Prometheus stole fire and gave it to men, but when Zeus learned of it, he he ordered Hephaestus to nail his body to Mount Caucasus. On it, Prometheus was nailed and kept bound for many years. Every day, an equal
eagle swooped on him and devoured the lobes of his liver, which grew by night. This is the Greek mythological story of the Titan Prometheus, who famously stole fire from the gods and gave it to men, and has often been cited by pop culture to embody the theme of the danger and folly of human technology. Nolan shortens the quote here to make it more direct, less academic, more of a warning, and the kind of eternal death sentence that Oppenheimer might feel he deserves. The Burden Sherwin book was first picked up by Christopher Nolan back in 2019, when, following the rap on his previous film Tenet, Robert Pattinson gifted Nolan with a book of Oppenheimer's speeches as a nod to this moment in Tenet. You're familiar with the Manhattan Project? As they approached the first atomic test, Oppenheimer became concerned that the detonation might produce a chain reaction. The, the premise of Tenet is that a scientist in the future was her generation's Oppenheimer, who invented a method to invert time, but her colleagues want to use this technology to destroy the past. So fearing this, she split up her algorithm into nine pieces and hid these pieces in nuclear test sites around the world. So in a sense, Tenet is a reverse Oppenheimer, an unknown scientist in the future trying to rewind a toothpaste back into the bottle. Stephen Colbert actually asked Christopher Nolan about this line in Tenet. Is that moment related to you making this film? I mean, definitely. I Every time I make a film, I try to put sort of, I guess I try to leave each film with interesting questions that maybe in some unrelated form or possibly related form, I sort of pick up with the next film. I love this. It reminds me of how every Pixar film contains an Easter egg pointing to the next release in their pipeline, like Boo having a Nemo doll in Monsters, Inc. Nolan confirming this in February is honestly what made me want to spend this year looking at all of his films, because we could look at each one as if it's in conversation with each other, and they all kind of occupy a Nolan internal cinematic universe. Now we're left wondering, what is it in Oppenheimer that will inspire Nolan's next film? What was it about Dunkirk that inspired Tenet. Was it just wanting to work with Robert Pattinson again? I wouldn't blame him if so. By the way, I didn't really have any good shirt ideas to accompany this Nolan rewatch series, except this one, which I honestly think is great. I didn't get Tenet. An acknowledgement of the humility we all share. It's really the best way to support the Deep Dive channel. You can grab one of these at nerdriot.shop. Okay, the fire and the stomping continue to rage in Oppenheimer's mind until he snuffs them by opening his eyes, as we now find ourselves in a hearing to renew his security clearance in the year 1954. A superimposed title appears to is left one vision. Compared to the two fusion text that appears beside Louis Strauss in a moment, these two words represent the differences of a fission reaction, which splits an atomic nucleus, the process that was used to build the atomic bombs in the Manhattan Project, versus a fusion reaction, which violently collides two atomic nuclei to release an even greater force of energy used in the later generation hydrogen bombs that Strauss advanced and Oppenheimer spoke out against. So we're looking at the fission era of Oppenheimer's career and the trial he faces over the bogus security vulnerabilities stemming from Oppenheimer's socialist connections hovering around the Manhattan Project versus the fusion era in which Strauss is under trial for his selfish antagonism against Oppenheimer. This movie swings from a splitting of one man's mind, fission, to the even more violent collision of two egos, fusion. And as a historical autobiographical drama, Nolan's story does resemble Aaron Sorkin's The Social Network, which also recounts the history of how an introspective loner builds something that ruins the world and telling the story by jumping across parallel legal proceedings that happen in different eras of time. Oppenheimer doesn't even know what this proceeding is. Yes, Your Honor. We're not judges, Doctor. No. Already we are seeing that this is a sham hearing that is just designed theatrically to make Oppenheimer feel like he's on criminal trial. Much has been made of how Christopher Nolan's screenplay for this film takes the unusual step of putting exposition into the first person. For this scene, on page one, you can read, peer into my soul, and I glance down at my notes. Nolan did this so that when the full cast and crew read the screenplay, they would know that this story would be told fully from Oppenheimer's subjective point of view, and that everyone's performance and every shot should reflect the way Oppenheimer mind's eye would see them. Because Nolan didn't want this to just be a historical film about World War II or the Manhattan Project, he wanted it to be a personal horror of a man bringing his own greatest fears to life. So Oppenheimer reads from his statement, The so-called derogatory information in your indictment of me cannot be fairly understood except in the context of my life and my work. Oppenheimer both disputes that being called a former socialist amounts to properly derogatory, semantics that Kitty will later weaponize against Roger Robb, and tells us that in order to understand the bomb, we have to understand him. This subjectivity even affects the focus pull of this shot, creating this distortion effect on Oppenheimer's wife, Kitty, played by Emily Blunt, hidden in plain sight in the background, looking like a ghastly skull. She's right there in this opening shot, but the first time we watch this movie, we don't even realize it's Emily Blunt right there until like an hour from now. 
She's just this kind of visual ghost that haunts Oppenheimer from the shadows, the skeleton of the loved ones he has burned through his choices. Then we cut to Louis Strauss in 1958, Robert Downey Jr. facing his own upcoming hearing to be approved as Commerce Secretary by the US Senate. Nolan shoots the Strauss-focused scenes in black and white to help viewers separate the timelines of the film, but also as a device that he used in his 2000 film Memento, which we will get to on this channel. In Memento, the black and white scenes progress forward in chronology and represent objective, factual reality. The scenes in color regress backward in time and represent Leonard's subjective point of view, and we can't always trust exactly what we see. Similarly, in this film, we can look at Strauss's black and white scenes as cold objective fact, even down to his misreading of Oppenheimer's exchange with Albert Einstein. Because if you think about it, we didn't actually see any tea be spilled there. What did you say to him? The reality is there was no there there when it came to Strauss. But as he's asked about the Oppenheimer hearing by a Senate aide played by Alden Ehrenreich, Strauss gives this little tell when he shifts from posturing like he never thinks about the Oppenheimer hearing. How long did he testify? Honestly, I forget. Well, I've only read the transcripts. To revealing that he clearly thinks about it every night. Are they really going to ask about it? It was years ago. Four years ago. Five. And I love this detail because while the hearing was in 1954, four years before 1958, for Strauss, the plot to destroy Oppenheimer's reputation actually began a year before that, when Oppenheimer had embarrassed him when they were both at the Atomic Energy Commission. So in this moment, this Senate aide realizes, huh, this actually was a far more personal feud than Strauss is letting on. And yes, Alden Ehrenreich had previously played Han Solo in Solo A Star Wars Story because every actor in this film, down to the supporting players, had appeared first on call sheets in their past projects. Projects. It's all A-listers here. And maybe it's just a superficial aspect by which to judge a film, but this was a movie literally everyone in Hollywood wanted to be a part of. So the Senate aide says, Senator Thurman asked me to say not to feel that you're on trial. Really, Mr. Strauss. It's admirable. Robert Downey Jr. identified a key part of Strauss's character to immediately correct people on his name and title. Notice he does this later in a very important moment when it comes to Strauss versus Strauss. Mr. Strauss. It's pronounced Strauss. So for Oppie's 1954 security clearance hearing, Strauss deliberately set it up in this claustrophobic office space, and Nolan's team found a tiny, tiny office in Alhambra, California to force the actors into this cramped space so that they would be up in each other's faces and forced to sit just feet away from someone when they would be testifying against them. Roger Robb asks Oppenheimer if he was happier studying in Cambridge. I was troubled by visions of a hidden... I love this. The edit happens on the word invisible, so that just the word visible is replaced by this insert. Troubled by visions of a hidden universe. So Nolan faced an interesting challenge with this movie when it came to depicting the atom and subatomic particles without using any computer-generated visual effects. To do this, VFX supervisor Andrew Jackson, VFX producer Mike Chambers, and special effects supervisor Scott Fisher constructed a series of science experiments, they called them, in this tent that was off to the side of the set involving magnetized beads spinning super fast or shooting falling sand and bursts of water in slow motion, and IMAX even built them a special lens to shoot in macroscopic extreme close-ups. In the making of documentary, they show one of these apparatuses that spins beads in a basin over a magnetized sphere, causing them to collide chaotically so that at higher speeds they would have to cover it with a plexiglass surface. Their own devices were like little atomic bombs that could do damage. This is why it's important to have the script written in the first person. The effects team is inspired by this challenge to make something that should be an invisible hypothetical and render it real and tangible and messy and potentially physically painful. In their closed off tent, they were kind of like Oppenheimer's Los Alamos Manhattan Project, building something that had never been made before. All of this chaos is bottled up inside of Oppie's mind as he just looks at rainwater outside of a window. This impressionable American left his home to study the new physics of Europe and the possibilities broke his brain so badly that he needed all of us to be broken too. On Oppie's pillow, notice his world is vibrating with that same chaos. Nolan used this effect throughout the film and they accomplish this by taking a photo of the background surface from the angle of the lens and then projecting that same image with light upon itself and then just vibrating that light projector. But Oppie's inner chaos erupts into his outer world as he shatters the lab beaker. His teacher, Patrick Blackett, played by James Darcy, who plays Edwin Jarvis in the MCU, is gnawing on a red apple the moment he chastises Oppie. And as soon as they head off to Niels Bohr, another student replaces that red apple with a green apple. Green for go 
poison your teacher. So Oppenheimer poisoning Blackett's apple with potassium cyanide is documented in American Prometheus, as well as another biography of Oppenheimer written by Ray Monk, A Life Inside the Center, and they're both referencing a number of Oppenheimer's real-life friends who repeated this to them. But that second biography states that Oppenheimer relayed his story so many times in many different versions of Friends throughout his life. Reportedly, Cambridge authorities found out about it and threatened to place criminal charges, and Robert's father intervened. But really, all we know for sure is that Robert Oppenheimer sought psychiatric treatment after this period of his life, as this movie also states. But we have to say reportedly about all this, because Robert's grandson, Charles Oppenheimer, publicly disputes this ever happened. He calls the whole Poisoned Apple episode historical revision, and he says that it was just kind of like a humorous anecdote that J. Robert Oppenheimer would say to his friends, and that none of them actually took it seriously. However, Charles Oppenheimer praises Nolan's film, and I'm okay with Nolan including this anecdote, not just because of the numerous sources documenting that it did happen at Cambridge, but really because, like the shot of black gloves drowning Gene Tatlock later, Nolan is okay framing reality in subjective ways to tell a greater truth about the man, that there was a simmering chaos inside of him to use science to dispense violent justice, but that he's equally terrified of having that blood on his hands. And Nolan even leaves that apple in the close-up with a cyanide just dripping down the side of it, pooling on the desk, to show that for Oppie, it wasn't really a premeditated act of attempted murder, but really just kind of an act of impulse against Blackett's relationship with his other ass-kissing pupils. Oppie's anger can really be understood as Blackett in this scene denying him a chance to therapeutically calm his nightmares, as Danish physicist Nils Bohr, played by Kenneth Branagh, is one thinker who can put into words what Oppenheimer sees in his nightmarish visions. Einstein's opened the door, now we are peering through, seeing a world inside our world. Hearing his quantum physics visions aren't a form of insanity, Oppie finally is able to sleep at night, and he dreams remembering the stars over New Mexico and feeding his horse a what? Apple! <gasps> so he rushes back to the classroom to dispose the evidence, and he meets Nils Bohr. J. Robert Oppenheimer. What's the J stand for? Nothing. So the J actually does stand for something. It stands for Julius, Robert's father, but Oppenheimer would apparently go around insisting that the J stood for nothing. However, ironically, Robert's later political foe, Harry S. Truman, did use that middle initial of S, which actually did stand for nothing. Like another political foe, Louis Strauss, he did make little adjustments to his name in order to put on a front and opportunistically move ahead in his career. So I'm sorry if it seems like I'm analyzing every line of this amazing movie, but this is a deep dive. So take a look at this. You ask the only good question. I heard you give the same question. Harvard, yes, and you ask the same question. I'd like your answer. Did you like it better yesterday? A lot. So I love this. The movie never states exactly what question Oppenheimer asked Bohr at both Harvard and Cambridge, but I'm wondering if it was something like, uh, Nils Bohr, could you modify your model to describe the behavior of multi-electron atoms and their spectral lines, considering the limitations of classical mechanics? Because Oppie would have attended Bohr's lecture at Harvard in October 1923, a year after Niels Bohr won the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1922. But this conversation at Cambridge would have been three years after that in 1926, and in those three years, a ton of advances had been made in quantum mechanics that would have further expanded Bohr's thinking in a specific way that would have settled Oppie's anxieties, and that's why he likes the answer better now. But Ken Branagh is not helping his anxieties in this moment because he gesticulates with his apple, threatening to bite it at any moment, driving Oppie crazy as he desperately lunges to bottle this weapon of mass destruction. Wormhole. Ah, wormhole. Obviously a bit of physicist wordplay, but physicists did coin the term wormhole from the visual of worms burrowing through apples. And apples are important symbols to great thinkers, as the orb that struck Newton's head, but also Alan Turing committed suicide by ingesting a poisoned apple. And some claim that is why Steve Jobs called his company Apple, when in reality Steve Jobs just wanted the company to show up first alphabetically. So Niels Bohr sends Oppie to seek Max Born in Germany, and he compares algebra to sheet music. Can you hear the music, Robert? This brings us to this stunningly scored montage by composer Ludwig Göransson, who, with Nolan, selected the violin as Oppenheimer's signature instrument, as it is a tightly strung and nuanced instrument, sensitive in the way that it can make a beautiful sound in one second, and then a frightening or sour sound in the next section. Göransson's wife, Serena McKinney, is a violinist herself and played the main melody that we hear. 
And during this montage, it really just lasts 1 minute 47 seconds. And Göransson composed 27 separate tempo changes so that literally it speeds up on average once every 5 seconds. And you can hear and apparently was agonizing to get this recording with the musicians in one continuous take, but they got it. We see Oppie opening his mind to art and literature, including T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, which is a chaotic post-World War I allegory that explores mankind's continual destruction of cities, just like Oppie will end up doing. The poem actually begins with spring raindrops and then ends with a broken man standing alone on a shore as uncertainty looms and droplets of rain fall rhythmically around him once again mirroring the opening shot and the closing shot of this movie. This poem is also known for its Sanskrit mantras, which likely would have inspired Oppenheimer's famous quoting of the Sanskrit passage in the Bhagavad Gita. But then we see Abhi staring at Pablo Picasso's woman sitting with arms crossed, which, little continuity error there, wasn't painted until 1937, like a decade after this, when Picasso was transitioning from surrealism to his post-war period. It's actually the same year he painted his famous Guernica mural, depicting the Spanish Civil War. But this painting depicts Picasso's lover, Marie Therese Walter, who he started dating when he was 45 and she was 17 back in 1927, the year Oppie would be looking at this. Uh, but you know, Oppie also had a um, philandering experience as well when it came to his lovers. But then we see Oppie playing this record, Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, a famous 1913 work known for causing a riot when it played at the Opera of Paris. It was such a revolutionary work, though technically the riot wording didn't really appear in print when it came to Rite of Spring until reviews of later performances in 1924, which would be two years before Oppy started listening to it in this scene. So he probably just read the word riot in the newspaper and he's like, I gotta listen to this revolutionary record. But I love it. There's a brief insert of Oppy in bed with the spinning electrons over his face, which you think must be VFX, right? But no, Christopher Nolan himself spun these lights in front of Killian Murphy between him and the lens. But then we cut back to Strauss's point of view, where the senator from Wyoming begins asking about Strauss's history with Oppenheimer. This would be Senator Gail M. McGee, junior senator from Wyoming, who spearheaded the movement against Strauss's nomination. Without this guy, his braveness to go against the great Dwight D. Eisenhower, Strauss would have succeeded. So Strauss takes us back to 1947, when Strauss greeted Oppenheimer at Princeton when he invited him to join the Atomic Energy Commission. This, I believe, is the only location in the film where Nolan shoots outdoor shots from Strauss's point of view in black and white using natural light. All the other black and white scenes are indoors. And since Nolan shot the full film in IMAX, they had to request Kodak to print IMAX celluloid for black and white for this movie. It did not exist before this movie. But you know, Christopher Nolan has been such a defender of printing on film is basically with a couple other directors really being the only ones to keep Kodak in business. But that's how important these moments were to the film, to capture the nuance and the subtle shadows of the face, the microaggressions as these two men got to know each other. Oppie says, Mr. Strauss, it's pronounced Strauss. Oppenheimer, Oppenheimer, from the way you say it, they know I'm Jewish. So right off the bat, shots fired. Oppenheimer shames Strauss for professionally masking his Jewish background, saying that his name is Strauss, not Strauss. Something Oppenheimer is unable to do. But Strauss defends himself, saying that he's president of Temple Emanuel in Manhattan, and that Strauss is just a southern pronunciation, which Oppenheimer knows is a load of shit. But this little moment reveals everything about the two men. Oppenheimer knows that key to them beating the Germans to the bomb was German anti-Semitism and the rejection of what Hitler deemed to be Jewish science. And Strauss, meanwhile, gets triggered by a more famous Jew calling out his shame-filled opportunism. Oppie doesn't even look at him as he says the line, seemingly barely even registering how this remark landed, which is even more insulting to Strauss. But to Strauss, this continues to needle away at him throughout the conversation. This awkward greeting is what snowballs Strauss into misinterpreting Oppenheimer's moment with Einstein later, who was famously a Jew who fled Europe to escape the Nazis. Because of Oppenheimer's little dismissive remark about name pronunciation, Strauss remained paranoid that these two Jewish men were called calling him a coward. But this mystery of what Oppenheimer and Einstein really said to each other is the rosebud of this movie. It's the seemingly small but life-defining secret revealed only in the final seconds of this film, in this case, the final words of Oppenheimer. And Robert Downey Jr. is so great for this entire film, but the way he carries this sequence with the layers of Shakespeare's Iago completely unwinding but having to bury it all under this measured facade is why he deserved to win the Oscar for this performance. Now, for the set of Oppie's office, they actually shot in the real office of Albert Einstein that remains at Princeton because they needed a view of the pond in order to set up the shot of Strauss being able to witness the other two through the window. The fact that Downey was standing in Albert Einstein's real life office must have been helpful for the actor to convey that crippling fear of missing out. And when Oppenheimer sees the elder outside, inside the two men continue to insult each other in these subtle ways. Strauss says, why don't you invite Einstein into the Manhattan Project? He's the greatest 
scientific mind of our time. And Oppie arrogantly says, of his time, and says that Einstein's theory of relativity, which was published in 1905, was incomplete for the quantum theories that they were using. And then Strauss quotes, God doesn't play dice, signaling that he read Einstein's 1945 opinion of quantum theory, and for all of its randomness and its embrace of chaos. And Einstein went on to write, God tirelessly plays dice under the laws which he has himself prescribed. So Strauss is essentially saying, oh, you think you're so high and mighty in your Jewishness? I'm the one who's bringing God in this conversation. And yeah, I'm more of a Jewish subscriber to Einstein because he said this about your studies, you heathen. But Oppie just says precisely, as in, yeah, Einstein could only see so far. That's why he said that. But then Oppie gets personal by pointing out that Strauss has never studied physics himself. And then Strauss signals that, hey, I didn't have time to go into academia because I was selling shoes. Instead of being a lofty Ivy League academic, not realizing that Oppenheimer totally had a background in ranching in New Mexico. I had offers, but I chose to sell shoes. No, Strauss was once a lowly shoe salesman. No, just a shoe salesman. Ah, notice how Oppie made sure to drag the vowel sound of ah in Strauss to again mock Strauss's code switching. Okay, so then we see the big moment. From a distance, Strauss witnessing Oppie picking up Einstein's hat, which he thinks is just a nice friendly gesture. But we find out later it's the exact opposite. And editor Jennifer Lame does this fascinating cut to Strauss surreally sauntering toward them slowly across the lawn so that we kind of cut past what happened in their full exchange, really just to linger on Einstein's frowning as he passes Strauss. Something that seems like it's the biggest thing in the world to Strauss, but really it's like the least important part of that moment. Albert. What did you say to him? And even as Oppie is trying to move the conversation on, you can see Einstein's shrinking form framed between them in the background because Strauss cannot get over that little moment that clearly he made about himself. But really the hat was not a gentle thing between colleagues who respect each other. It was a seizure of power and authority. That hat is a symbolic wardrobe item for Oppenheimer because his friend Robbie advises Oppenheimer to wear the hat at Los Alamos as the uniform of a scientist as opposed to a military man. And Oppenheimer rocks that hat as a statement piece ever since. Meanwhile, Einstein losing his hat from the wind and Oppie picking it up for the old man represents Einstein losing his footing in the scientific community now that it is Oppenheimer's show. Really, there's a cinematic history to this gesture of having your hat blown off. Spielberg loved to do this shot. Christopher Nolan did it himself in The Dark Knight Rises. Really, it's just a way of showing characters kind of blown away by circumstances that they are no longer in control of, like being blown away by an atomic blast. So back in 1958, Strauss tells the committee that Oppie's left meanings hadn't worried him at first. But just then I was entirely consumed with what he must have said to Einstein to sour him on me. <laughs> Yeah, the room laughs because what a silly thing to worry about. But Strauss is telling the complete truth. That concern did fully consume him, even now. We flash back to Oppie in Holland, where he's met by Isidore Robbie, played by the wonderful David Krumholtz. A Yank lecturing on the new physics. This I have to hear. Hey, the bull sing to us an alpha delta in an atom. What's he saying? So reportedly, the Dutch that Killian Murphy speaks here was first spoken by the movie's director of photography, Hoyt van Hoytema, who is Dutch and Swedish, and Killian just tried to repeat what he heard, but Dutch speaking viewers watched this scene and could not make sense of what he was saying and said it sounded more German. But if you listen closely, it does kind of sound like he's saying the words vision energy and hidden universe. Oppie gets distracted by rain on the train window as Nolan again spins light over it to form electron rings and Oppie's seat vibrates from that projection effect we talked about. But Robbie offers him an orange. If you get any skinnier, we're gonna lose you between the seat cushions. Yeah, his seat is really vibrating from quantum energy and Oppie's mind is sinking into this quantum universe. But the offering of the orange is not only a kinder fruit to offer compared to say a poisoned apple, but Robbie as a whole represents Oppie's Jewish mother telling him what to eat, teasing him for not learning Yiddish, and then just kind of sensing that something is dangerous here. Did we get the feeling our kind isn't entirely welcome here? Physicists, it's funny. And Robbie is more correct than he realizes in this conversation. Hitler's rejection of quantum physics as Jewish science is the ultimate benefit that these men are able to exploit. So in Zurich, they watch Werner Heisenberg speak, and there is this really cool effect with the dialogue. But an Assatz und is nicht die Voraussetzung. One might be led to the presumption that behind the quantum world, 
Yeah, he starts his line in German, but as he turns his head toward Oppie and Robbie, we hear him in English. He says his speculations are fruitless, again, tying in that motif of apples and oranges, and how, while Heisenberg's Gentile approach will ultimately sink like a lead balloon, the Jewish advantage of Oppie's team is what ultimately bears fruit. This opening section of the film introduces us to names like Nils Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, men whose principles we studied in grade school science, really to show us that Oppenheimer's work was as fundamental to our lives as these other men's work was, and that all of these people's work was really just pretty recent within the past century. Robbie jokes about Oppie. He's pining for the canyons of Manhattan. Yes, to Robbie, Manhattan skyscrapers are like steel canyons, but also it foreshadows Oppie's work on the Manhattan Project in the canyons of New Mexico. Oppie takes a teaching job at Berkeley and meets Ernest Lawrence, played by Josh Hartnett, who incepts the all-important theme for Oppenheimer. Theory will get you only so far. Theory will only get you so far echoes back when these men read about the Germans' vision breakthrough. Theory will take you only so far. And when Hans Betten finishes the calculations that they could blow up the world. Yes, yo. The area will take you only so far. Killian Murphy played the Inception target in the film Inception, and you can consider these words to have the same effect on this character. The theories are his nightmares, and he believes the only cure to those nightmares are to apply theories via engineering. Theory will only get you so far, but the grim truth that he'll learn is that some theories should stay in the mind. Oppenheimer's first class is only one student, Giovanni Laminitz, the first Berkeley student who took a chance on him, and by the end of this film is blacklisted and has to lay railroad track. But in truth, while Laminitz did work as a railroad maintenance worker, in 1962, he began working for the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology and ended up retiring as the head of that organization in 1991. But Oppie would have reported the railroad gig during his hearing back in 1954, when the blacklists were still in effect. Because this entire movie is not like a biographical epilogue of all of these characters, it's just the way Oppie saw his own guilt. Oppie lectures to a larger class about stars as furnaces in space pushing outward against their own gravity. But if that furnace cools... Gravity starts winning, it contracts. Density increases. It's a vicious cycle until, what's the limit here? So this student is Harlan Snyder, and this conversation is the origin of the Oppenheimer-Snyder model for general relativity published in 1939 that was used to describe the collapse of stars into black holes. Yes, the very notion of black holes was in part attributed to J. Robert Oppenheimer. So in a way, Christopher Nolan is identifying the origin point of his climactic set piece in Interstellar. Really, he references all of his movies and his past work in this one biographical drama. Lawrence tells Oppie to keep his commie bullshit out of the classroom, not just because Ernest is a conservative, but because his electron machine made him displaced from time. Do know Oppie's future political enemies would weaponize his socialist connections against him. Run, Oppie, run! No, seriously though, I love how everything in this movie is people warning Oppie not to do things, but Oppie having a stubborn sense of destiny to unleash his mental chaos. Oppie attends the party with his brother Frank, and since he's super dismissive of Frank's date Jackie, there's this really great shot of Frank being pulled away by the commie red dressed Jackie from Oppie's point of view in the conversation circle almost as if to show his brother being tugged out of his life by these political crosswinds. Chevalier is played by Jefferson Hall, who played the well-dressed man in the opening opera extraction of Tenet. He asks what Oppie's working on, and Oppie brings up his classroom conversation with Snyder. The bigger the star, the more violent its demise. Their gravity gets so concentrated, it swallows everything. Ah, more foreshadowing to what will happen to Oppenheimer in his career. He reaches massive stardom, which sets him up for a more violent demise. Oppie meets Jean Tatlock, Florence Pugh, and flirts with her by saying he actually read Karl Marx's Das Kapital. Ownership is theft. Property. Property? Property, not ownership. I'm sorry, I read it in the original German. Yes, Abi proves he can think in other languages, specifically think the way Germans do, which is also something he will apply later at Los Alamos. But the distinction between ownership and property reassigns the blame from the object to the subject, as in the existence of the weapon of mass destruction is not the evil, it's really the people who built that weapon and used that weapon that represent the evil. Really, all it takes is these two sweaty commies admitting that they like wiggle room in their views of the world, and bam, Christopher Nolan goes from a director known for cold sexless stories to the only OnlyFans experience you could find on Barbenheimer Weekend in July 2023, because those characters had no genitalia. I have all, all the genitals. Sensing that Oppie can only be turned on by academic eurekas, Gene goes to his shelf. You only have a shelf full of Freud? Well, actually, my background's more... Uh, Jungian? 
Yes. Oppie says, young Ian, with such disappointment. And I am obsessed with Killian Murphy's line read on the word young Ian. So let's break down the four ways we can overthink this. One, the script of this moment moves on to Oppie's past psychoanalysis after his poison apple incident at Cambridge, hinting that he hated how ineffective young Ian analysis was during those sessions. Two, Christopher Nolan is obsessed with Carl Jung and concepts like the collective unconscious, archetypal symbols, and impulses that haunt the minds of every human being, regardless of cultural background. These were especially key to Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, for which Killian Murphy appeared as Dr. Jonathan Crane, aka Scarecrow, in all three of those films, who weaponized Jungian archetypes. So in a sense, Killian Murphy is saying, ugh, not young again, Christopher. Three, Carl Jung also once famously said the following late in his life, which applies to Oppenheimer's predicament pretty specifically. Quote, man is bound to follow the exploits of his scientific and inventive mind and to admire himself for his splendid achievements. At the same time, he cannot help admitting that his genius shows an uncanny tendency to invent things that become more and more dangerous because they represent better and better means of wholesale suicide. Nature may anticipate all our attempts by turning against man against his own creative mind and by releasing the H-bomb or some equally catastrophic device, put an effective stop to overpopulation. In spite of our proud domination of nature, we are still her victims as much as ever and have not even learnt to control our own nature, which slowly and inevitably courts disaster. I mean, that's kind of Oppenheimer in a nutshell, right? But for this could just be a sex thing, right? As Freud was a psychoanalyst far more interested in sex, and so for Gene Tatlock to have a shelf full of Jung instead of Freud, Oppie could just be disappointed that she's lost interest and he's not getting any. And I feel like Christopher Nolan and Carl Jung would be proud of me overthinking this one word line read. But actually, the sex is just beginning because Gene finds Oppie's <gasps> Bhagavad Gita, sensing that he's learning Sanskrit to help himself make sense of the world in any language possible, and uses that academic kink to trigger a different Eureka. And now I am become death. Destroyer of worlds. And we cut out the shot in the middle of that phrase because this is YouTube. But in between those phrases, Gene totally reaches down below frame and, you know, puts Oppie in position, so to speak. Now, of course, this translation would go on to be what J. Robert Oppenheimer famously quoted in his 1965 NBC documentary, which this film and various historians interpret as both Oppenheimer's shared regret over his invention and his sorrow for what ended up happening to Gene Tatlock. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. Oppie, Frank, and Lawrence camp in New Mexico. A little break before dawn. Air cools overnight. Another bit of foreshadowing. A storm will sweep this land in the hours before the Trinity test, but Oppie then will also instinctively know when the storm will pass and keep us cool. So back at Berkeley, word gets out that the Germans have successfully produced a fission reaction, splitting the uranium nucleus by bombarding it with neutrons. The chemical reaction of fission parallels the interpersonal fission Oppie goes through in this part of the film, torn between his academic ambitions and his sparks for Gene Tatlock and the socialist sympathizing that comes with that. He attends an FAECT meeting where the commies chant his name. The pleasure he takes in this validation from his liberal arts colleagues sets up his desire to get the same response from his STEM colleagues later on at Los Alamos. But that cheering room will terrify him, ultimately. Oppie and Hartland Snyder's Black Hole Theory gets published, and it is true that their third paper was published on September 1st, 1939, the same day Germany invaded Poland and ignited World War II. So truly, all of Oppie's academic advances in quantum theory occurred with the backdrop of an anti-Semitic existential threat. We learn how Oppie met Kitty, and for the first First time, Emily Blunt comes into focus behind Oppie in the hearing room. And whereas Oppie needed to quote Marx to flirt with Jean and ultimately have to use Sanskrit to get going, Kitty proves to be the truer partner for Oppenheimer by letting him flirt in his own language. Forces of attraction strong enough to convince us that matter is solid. Kitty understands that for Robert, quantum mechanics are what give the vast emptiness a physical human weight and touch. In New Mexico, Kitty tells Oppie about her past husbands, including the socialist who's really the point of Oppie sharing this memory, because remember, this is subjective. So Emily Blunt has to play this part just a little bit extra in her dismissiveness of socialist idealism, because this is really Oppie telling the board his wife's leanings were just tied in with this fling marriage of a guy from Youngstown who died fighting in the Spanish Civil War. My husband offered both our future to stop one fascist bullet from embedding itself in a mud bank. That's the definition of nothing. Seems a little reductive. Pragmatic. Ah, notice how a few scenes later, when Lawrence tells him that his left leanings are keeping him from being asked to join the Manhattan Project, the same word comes back. Because you're not just self-important, you're actually important. I get it. If 
you could just be a little more pragmatic. Pragmatic. He echoes the same word Kitty told him for why she left the party. So in the middle of these scenes, Oppenheimer breaks up with Jean after getting Kitty pregnant and getting her to leave her current marriage, suggesting that he doesn't really care about this scandal in their academic community. So Jean warns. Don't alienate the only people in the world that understand what you do. One day you might need them. A lesson that will weigh heavily throughout Oppenheimer's life. One also senses in this a message from Christopher Nolan to himself as a filmmaker. Always value your crew, as they will be the only ones who understand your creative madness and will jump off that cliff with you. That's what Strauss suggests to the Senate aide back in the 1958 timeline, blaming Borden for snitching on Oppie's commie past to the FBI based on a security file that was given to him by someone who wanted him silenced because his ego offended people in Washington. And he wasn't always patient with us mere mortals. Yes, Strauss ironically implies that Oppie sees himself as superior to mortals, tying in with the illusion of Prometheus. Strauss recalls an AEC vote on the export of isotopes to Norway, which Strauss opposed, claiming that they could be used to build atomic weapons on a country that was kind of on the border of the Soviet bloc. But Oppie testified mocking the idea, saying a shovel or a bottle of beer could be used too. So Strauss wonders, Look at this man who saw so much be so blind. Yes, he's referring to the tragedy of Oppenheimer, but he doesn't see how this statement applies to himself as well. He saw so much of Oppie's moment with Einstein and the isotope hearing, but he was blinded by his own ego and thinking Oppie had this personal grudge against him, when in reality, it was more of a Don Draper and Ginsburg relationship. I feel bad for you. I don't think about you at all. Now there's a lot going on in Oppenheimer, but one of the main themes is the importance of really understanding how the world works. And if you ever wanted to learn about pretty much anything, Brilliant is a great tool. Brilliant is where you learn by doing with thousands of interactive lessons in science, math, data analysis, programming, and AI. Each Brilliant lesson is filled with hands-on problem solving that lets you play with concepts. They prioritize interactive problem solving over rote memorization, which is proven to be six times more effective than learning by watching lectures alone. Plus, all of Brilliant's content was created by a team of professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, Google, and more. Brilliant helps you build real knowledge in minutes a day with fun lessons you can do whenever you have time. It's the opposite of doom scrolling. After watching Oppenheimer, I wanted to know more about science, and Brilliant's scientific thinking lesson series was great. I started out with some fundamental lessons on simple machines like gears and pulleys, and wound up bootstrapping my way up to Einstein's special theory of relativity. No heavy math, no stressful exams, just a bunch of fun lessons. And them ready for my Nobel now. Thank you very much. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash deep dive NR or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now, one of the more uncomfortable scenes in the film is Oppenheimer coming home to find Kitty too drunk to care for their crying son, Peter. I have been calling to him all f day. So Oppenheimer has to bring the baby to Chevalier to take care of the kid for a time. And this actually did happen, but Oppenheimer and Kitty retook custody when they moved to New Mexico. And though it's not depicted in the film, later on in April 1945, Kitty left Los Alamos with Peter, citing depression, leaving their other baby, their daughter Catherine, in the care of a different couple in Los Alamos. So this movie's depiction of Kitty Oppenheimer does align with descriptions in American Prometheus. She did have a drinking problem, and she did not enjoy playing the role of homemaker. But you know, postpartum depression Depression is also a very real thing that was definitely underdiagnosed in the 1930s and 40s, and who knows, it might have had something to do with what was going on in that household. Given the criticisms Christopher Nolan has received in the past when it came to his writing for female characters, I kind of wish that he gave Kitty just a bit more grace when it came to this chapter of her life. His solution with Kitty in general seems to be giving her this triumph moment later in Roger Robb's cross-examination, but you know what? He really just quoted that directly from the actual transcript from history. But ultimately, I think it's important for Christopher for Nolan to include this part of the Oppenheimer family's life. Because thematically, for the story that Nolan is telling, he needs to establish how charitable Chevalier was to set up why Oppie and many Americans in the 30s and 40s were so friendly to socialists before McCarthyism took over the country. Because so many of these socialists were just decent, helpful people. Robert, you see beyond the world we live in. There is a price to be paid for that. Of course, we'll help you. So Oppie joins the project and meets Colonel Leslie Groves, Matt Damon, whom we first see spilling food on his uniform, which leads to this in the next scene. Have that dry clean. If that's how you treat Lieutenant Colonel, I'd hate to see how you treat a, a humble 
physicist. Oh, if I ever meet one, I'll let you know. I love the detail of Groves being a bit physically clumsy and always eating because Oppenheimer, who broke a beaker back at Cambridge, would just know that he has this in with a guy who has just a bit of slop. He's Sloppenheimer. But Gene's warning that Oppenheimer's ego at Berkeley would create a toxic reputation that preceded him definitely plays a role when Groves initially starts talking to him. But I love how Oppie adjusts his tone to win over this gruff colonel so the dialogue just clips along. Why don't you have a Nobel Prize? Why aren't you a general? They're making me one for this. Perhaps I'll have the same luck. The Nobel Prize for making a bomb. Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. I love the dialogue pacing there. Snap, 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 snap. Christopher Nolan is known for a pragmatic dialogue that just kind of goes over your head in some scenes, but this is just so clear and funny. It kind of reads like an exchange from an Aaron Sorkin script, like something you'd see in The West Wing or The Social Network or the Steve Jobs movie. It's fast, it's character revealing, it's funny, and it's weirdly educational. It's not so much a joke, it's just like a fact from history that ends the exchange. Because yes, it is true, we have awarded people scientific achievements in the past for things that were just very destructive. Oppie explains that given the Germans' 18-month head start with Heisenberg, the Americans' one hope is anti-Semitism, that the best Jewish scientists would have come to the United States, including Albert Einstein and most of the other scientists in this movie, and the American government wouldn't be so hesitant to fund what is considered the new science. And this scene is really like a master class in what you should do in a job interview. Like, notice how Oppenheimer pitches himself, like acting like he already has the job, and then sets things up so that he would be the only person who could make this happen. He's kind of like Indiana Jones in that scene where he drew the staff of Bra on the chalkboard to educate his military authorities in a classroom setting where he would have the most control. And Oppie does the same thing here. He uses the blackboard to command authority. He charts out the radiation lab at Berkeley, the Met lab in Chicago, the uranium refining in Tennessee, and the plutonium facility in Hanford, Washington. And he says that they must connect them all by rail at a nexus point that he says is Los Alamos. Now, of course, geographically, the nexus point between those four sites is it's not in New Mexico, it'd be somewhere in the Great Plains. But Oppie is really just suggesting a secret remote spot, a part of the country that he knows better than anyone else who'd be on the list. Now, Christopher Nolan certainly has a thing for trains, Oppenheimer with Groves and Nichols here, Dom and Mao's chosen method in Inception, and the importance of train lines to Thomas Wayne and Bruce Wayne in the early parts of Batman Begins. And I really think the whole train obsession comes down to the idea of it being a fixed destination and the ability to ride a train and observe one's life passively as a modern montage of right to left swiping imagery through a rectangular window. You gotta imagine a cinematic mind like Christopher Nolan is just obsessed with that concept. Oppie says that for true security and compartmentalization, they need to construct an entire town where scientists' families could live as well, so that no one would want to leave and would accidentally discuss their work with outsiders back home. We see a church and a barbershop being constructed, and actually in the making of documentary, you can see the town's cinema, and it has a marquee showing Roy William Neal's Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon, that's from 1942, Billy Wilder's Double Indemnity from 1944, Alfred Hitchcock's Spellbound from 1945, and Harry L. Frazier's Gunsmoke Mesa from 1944. But Oppie initially showed Groves a sight and says, the Local Indians come up here for very fights, but apart from that, I like how Nolan makes a point to mention that what Americans once considered vacant frontiers is actually the land of indigenous groups. And this comes back in Oppie's awkward conversation with President Truman. I hear you leaving Los Alamos. What should we do with it? Give it back to the Indians. And with Christopher Nolan's affection for Stanley Kubrick, we are reminded of the popular theory for The Shining, in which part of the curse for the Overlook Hotel was that it was actually constructed on an Indian burial ground. The site is supposed to be located on an Indian burial ground, and I believe they actually had to repel a few Indian attacks as they were building it. Which lead to crazy theories that come up in the Room 237 documentary that the entire film is really a metaphor for the unresolved bloodshed of indigenous tribes by white settlers. I think it's a very valid interpretation of the film, actually. And I think it's fair to say that this idea runs through Oppenheimer as well. Like, what makes Oppenheimer's project and Truman's use of the bomb even more craven is the fact that they had to irradiate sacred land in the process. A montage shows their recruiting of various physicists from around the country, first to Harvard, meeting Kenneth Bainbridge, played by Josh Peck, yes, from Drake and Josh, and he looks way older in the shot, and Donald Hornig, played by David Riesdahl, then to Princeton with Richard Feynman, played by Jack Quaid from The Boys and several other roles. I'm telling you, everyone in this film was top of the call sheet in something else. And then to MIT, where they meet scientist Edward Condon, played by Ollie Haskeby, who played Dr. Wilfred Nagel in Marvel's The Falcon of the Winter Soldier. He's the one who Matt Damon just loses it at. How about because this is the most important 
thing to ever happen in the history of the world. Now, what's interesting, in Nolan's script, he actually chronologically structures each of these encounters with different scientists, but in the edit, Jennifer Lame and Nolan work together to intercut all of these, so it really works up to a crescendo in which Matt Damon just suddenly loses it at the sky, and I think it works a lot better. But the last scientist he talks to is this man, played by actor Brett Del Buono, credited only as concerned scientist in the script, and he suggests that his socialist beliefs make him an ill fit for the Manhattan Project. They need us until they don't. It's yet another warning that proves true for Oppie, and I love how Bjornsson's strings slow down here to suggest a new dread that is creeping up on Oppie beyond World War II. The work he is doing might be really loading the gun of an American government that will one day point it at the socialist ideals that are now so important to him. But why didn't Christopher Nolan name this scientist when pretty much every other scientist with a speaking role in this movie is a real historical figure? Well, it's believed that this character is actually an amalgamation of two or three guys, Joe Weinberg and David Baum, who were PhD students at Berkeley with connections to the Communist Party, as well as Max Friedman, who was friends with these two and Oppenheimer at Berkeley. In the Chernobyl series, Craig Mazin did something similar with the character of Ulana Komyuk, who was a composite character meant to represent a large group of Soviet scientists who were all working together to contain the Chernobyl disaster. Izzy Robbie tells Oppenheimer that he's not joining the Manhattan Project, that he doesn't want the culmination of three centuries of physics to be a bomb, and again brings in some maternal advice for this young man. Take off that ridiculous uniform. You're a scientist. They need us for who we are. So be yourself, only better. And so Oppenheimer gives up playing dress up as a military officer and adopts this wide brimmed hat as a uniform unique to him, which is basically scientist rancher hybrid. This is an appearance that he will maintain when he becomes a public figure after the war. It's kind of like his armor, his costume. And again, it is why it is so important that Oppie picks up Einstein's hat when the wind blew it off. These hats are really how these scientists convey their flair, their experience, their knowledge. But I love this shot where he's strutting down the dirt road of Los Alamos. He cocks his head at someone who we don't even see he looks like a town sheriff in an old western film and isn't it interesting that his hat is not a classic white hat or a black hat but rather more gray toned as Oppenheimer occupies a moral gray area the costumers always depict Oppenheimer in a pale blue shirt because all the photos of the real man were in black and white with the exception of one colorized photo in which his shirt is this pale blue color and they just assumed like many self-manufactured figures of history whose reputations were staked on their genius like Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg they tend to default to wearing the same look every time they're in public. But Oppie pays the price for being the big dog scientist of the era. When you build a dream team of smartest nerds in the room, things break down immediately. Benny Safdie plays Edward Teller, the first to arrive, sweating from sprinting there to shut this down before any other egghead could even get a word in. Because Teller's calculations suggest they could ignite a chain reaction that never stops and continues to ignite every atom in the atmosphere of the planet. Teller understands that even these nerds talking about it is a link in that certain chain reaction. He is kind of living in the future, and he's sort of a theoretical time traveler trying to stop a dark timeline from unfolding. So Oppie returns to Princeton to consult Albert Einstein, who by the way is played in this movie by Tom Conti, who had a very small cameo as one of Bane's prisoners in The Dark Knight Rises. So in this moment in Princeton, we are seeing the first part of Oppenheimer and Einstein's conversation by the pond, what Oppie was referring to when he told Strauss that they had met before. Einstein is strolling with Kurt Gödel, saying that the man doesn't eat out of fear that the Nazis could still poison his food. Gödel would later die of malnutrition and starvation in 1978 when his wife was hospitalized and wasn't able to prepare food for him. It's super tragic, and his brief appearance in this film underlies how critical the Nazi exclusion of Jewish scientists was to the Americans, and why it's so hard for Oppenheimer to stomach it when Einstein so simply suggests that he has to share his findings with the Nazis if Teller is correct. From Oppenheimer's point of view, there is a man standing right over there in the trees who won't eat out of fear of the Nazis. And throughout the scene, Oppie's words to Einstein are interrupted by these sparks. Criticality, point of no return, massive explosive force, but this time the chain reaction doesn't stop. This is really the first time the film visually links Oppie's microscopic theoretical visions to a macro scale, as we see the globe consumed in fire and that fire wiping across their pond at Princeton. Because right now is the first time someone who truly understands Oppenheimer's anxiety on a granular level can see what he sees and understand what it really means. So here we are, hmm? lost in your quantum world of probabilities. And as they depart, Einstein says, This is yours, not mine. I love the thud that Göransson punctuates this exchange with. It's kind of like an explosion of a distant bomb. And every thud is preceded by a little ding. 
kind of like every little tinker they make could be the one that leads to the big boom that ends it all. And by saying this is yours, not mine, of course, Einstein is referring to Teller's math notes, but of course, he also means the responsibility of that risk. Oppenheimer returns to the Berkeley Radiation Lab where Hans greets him. Teller's home. He's home. Now remember, this is a subjective account that Oppenheimer is telling the security clearance hearing, so of course he would include how he was sure to shush Hans until they were in a secure room. Hans says that the chances are near zero, which of course is more anxiety inducing than if they were at like, say 20%. So then we get to the night of the dreaded Chevalier incident. We missed him. Mm -hmm. You want to adopt? She's kidding. <laughs> Emily Blunt is so good at conveying a nope, I'm not kidding. And while this seems like another dig at how Kitty is a bad mother, it's actually important for the plot of the scene because while Oppie makes martinis, Chevalier starts telling him about their communist friend Eltonton and how if he wanted to pass anything along to the Russians through him, he could. And Kitty interrupts this. The breath is down. Where are the martinis? So really, this is Oppie in front of the board reframing this memory from whatever it was to a harmless suggestion by Chevalier ended by Oppie's bad mom, Alki wife. He exploits that part of her to try to nip this in the bud. Who knows? In reality, Oppie might have entertained a much longer conversation with Chevalier. Meanwhile, at Strauss's hearing in 1958, we learn that they are bringing in a surprise scientist witness. Well, I'd like to know the name of the scientist testifying. I'd like the chance to cross-examine. This is not a court. Yes, similar to Oppenheimer accidentally calling his hearing board your honor, the tide is now shifting in this film to depict Strauss as equally scrutinized as Oppie in what he thinks is his life trial. Oppenheimer lectures his fellow scientists about the Halifax ship explosion in 1917. This refers to the French cargo ship, the SS Mont Blanc, when it collided with the Norwegian SS Emo, setting off the world's largest human-made explosion at the time. It killed 1,782 people and injured 9,000 others. Nolan depicts this explosion by showing its reflection on the water and the shockwave blowing across the surface and then debris splashing in the water, just like the way Oppenheimer envisioned the worldwide explosion rippling across the pond at Princeton and he initially fixated on the chain reaction of raindrops at Cambridge. Oppenheimer asks to compare an atomic blast's destructive power and they use for the first time the term kiloton. But Oppenheimer senses the pause this gives the room. The bomb will need a... <laughs> Gadget will need a 33 pound sphere about this size. So the gadget was the code word they used for this bomb that they were building, but Abi corrects the guy here so that these scientists wouldn't think of themselves as murderers and to hopefully codify things so that these people are less likely to speak or to write down the word bomb anywhere just for secrecy's sake. And it's pretty interesting that Christopher Nolan named this movie for all of its secrecy in the production under the production title of Gadget. Teller pulls a class clown move by folding a paper airplane in the back of the room, admitting he is bored and that they should spend their time constructing not a fission reaction but a fusion reaction which would release megatons. And the paper airplane in his hand also echoes the bomber cockpit that Oppie envisions himself inside of when these hydrogen bombs would be delivered. The script leaps from here, Teller's first pitch of a hydrogen bomb, to Strauss's memory, the panicked night in August 1949 when the Soviets conducted their first atomic test, sparking the chain reactive debate within the AEC over whether or not to advance to the hydrogen bomb. And almost comedically this table's floral centerpiece perfectly blocks from view Dane DeHaan's Major General Nichols, who we last saw carrying out some dry cleaning, but he now re-enters this movie as someone with an eye on security. So it's pretty hilarious how in this scene, it's like he's a snoop stepping out from behind a hedge. From Nichols' perspective, Nolan takes us back to Los Alamos, where we see the uranium and plutonium marble jars are fuller, which is just a good visual ticking clock in this section of the movie, and the scientists are deciding to build the bomb as an implosion device. While it seems like it was Oppenheimer's oversights that caused the leak, it's here when Gro Groves and Nichols bring in the German turned British Klaus Fuchs, who is later revealed to be the Soviet mole. Groves grumbles that Oppenheimer employed Serber's wife as a secretary and that all the scientists' wives are working support staff positions, but Oppenheimer did this as a security measure and to keep the scientists content. Other than philandering with Gene Tatlock, this movie paints Oppenheimer as one of the best when it comes to actual secrecy and compartmentalization. I think it's a virtue that Christopher Nolan respects as a film producer, because very rarely do secrets from his productions ever leak from the set. It's because he respects his crew as people and he knows all of them and he works with the same people and they all have this 
crazy loyalty to him. Oppenheimer did conduct cross-divisional open discussions, and that's what Strauss lingers on when we pop back out of Nichols' memory. Strauss asks about Teller's hydrogen bomb proposal, but Oppenheimer says that Teller's design was so impractical that they would have to be delivered by Oxcart, trying to just brush it off as a joke. But Ernest Lawrence starts to speak up, but then he silences himself, which really frustrates Strauss because he senses that Oppie just has this smug control over everyone who is at Los Alamos. And he says, Because if it can put us ahead again, the President of the United States needs to know about it. This little smile by Robert Downey Jr. perfectly conveys Strauss's incredulity at Oppie's nerve because he's basically saying, you know what, Oppie, you're not the commander in chief. You don't get to make these decisions. That's for the elected president, Harry S. Truman. Well, Harry S. Truman succeeded into office after Roosevelt's death and then was reelected by a razor thin margin, but still you get the point. And the fact that for many people in the country, Harry Truman had such a thin electoral mandate is part of the reason his use of the atomic weapons was so controversial historically. Meanwhile, Oppie and Condon break security protocol to visit the Met Lab in Chicago, where Fermi and Zillard have already conducted the first semi-sustaining nuclear chain reaction at the University of Chicago's Stag Field in a lab built underneath it. And Oppie says it's, quote, just as well that the field is out of commission because he knows that experimenting with plutonium is a major radiation risk as it was for the whole Chicago vicinity here. And it is here when Rami Malek first appears as David L. Hill. Thank you for the vote of comment. Confidence, Zillard. I really need that in the notes. When are you gonna try it out? Now there's a fun detail in the script for this moment, since it's from Oppenheimer's perspective, he just refers to this character as Glasses because he has no idea who this young assistant is. Despite Oppenheimer snapping at this guy, and despite Glader slapping his clipboard out of his hands, Hill keeping receipts is later what brings Strauss down because he remembers Oppenheimer as a scientist of utmost character who prioritized security to the point of people disliking him. Groves rages at Condon, and I think he just loves to scream at Condon in particular because this is the same guy he screamed at at MIT earlier, but it also might just be because they share alma maters, as we learn in the scene that Groves studied engineering at MIT and he had kept that from Oppenheimer. Groves might just be mad that a fellow MIT guy was so reluctant to join the team at first and he's been so whiny all this time, and I think it's why he's not that afraid to joke about his quitting. Aren't you more concerned about his discretion out there? We'll have him killed. I'm just kidding. And I just love how in the middle section of this movie, it works as its own mystery story. Who was the leak? Was it Condon who quit? Was it the Berkeley commie Lominitz when Lawrence had brought him to Los Alamos? Was it Oppie himself with his ties to Jean Tatlock and Chevalier? No, it was Klaus Fuchs who Groves and Nichols brought in. But Dane DeHaan's panicked finger pointing when he's playing Nichols in 1949 just really keeps us side eyeing everyone at this part of the film. Oppie confronts Nichols about Lominitz getting drafted, but after learning it was because Lominitz was trying to unionize the radiation lab in Berkeley, he backs off and promises to shut that down. And then suddenly, huh, what do you know? Nichols says his cue clearance has come through, almost as if it was up to him the whole time. Oppie uses this to visit Gene Tatlock in San Francisco for a hotel hookup. And here the film shifts to one of its most memorable shots, where Christopher Nolan glides behind Roger Robb's head to reveal Oppenheimer suddenly naked in this hearing room. When I first watched this movie, I noticed Kitty's eyes suddenly on her husband on the other side of Robb's head, and I thought the film might've been shifting to her point of view. But if you read the script, it really is still through Oppie's eyes here. The exposition reads, I am naked. And Kitty watches Tatlock, also naked, straddle me, head on my shoulder, facing Kitty. So what we are truly seeing is Oppenheimer's anxiety imagining what might be running through his wife's mind. And what's also pretty creepy is that Oppenheimer would be 11 years older than he was when he and Jean last had sex, but Florence Pugh is still playing Jean at the age of her death. So it's like a guy in his 50s screwing a much, much younger woman. And here the stomping sound effect comes back. When did you see her after that? I never saw her again. It's the ultimate sound of Oppenheimer's impending dread. That feeling when you tell yourself you did the right thing, but it left you with blood on your hands. Stomps of victory mixed with the sounds of bombs dropping. We see shots of Jean's reported taking of her own life, piling pillows by the bathtub and her hair floating in the water as water drops cause another chain reaction ripple effect. Now, of course, later in this film, Nolan and Jennifer Lame splice in a very brief insert of an alternate explanation. Blacked gloved hands shoving Jean's head in the bathtub, drowning her. Left a note, not signed. She took barbiturates, but there was chloral hydrate in her blood. 
It is crazy that Nolan put this in the movie. Because over the decades, various researchers, journalists, writers, and Jean Tatlock's brother Hugh have speculated that she could have been deliberately murdered by the government to keep Oppenheimer focused on his research. They've looked at things like the toxicology report, the general anti-communist effort against Oppenheimer, but others have looked at her suicide note and felt, well, there's like specific literary references that only Jean and Oppenheimer would have shared. But Nolan frames this shot in Oppenheimer's point of view as a way of saying that this is just a possibility that Oppie considered, but by including the shot in the movie at all, suggests that Nolan thinks this theory is plausible. So Oppenheimer stops by the Berkeley office of Lieutenant Johnson to ask about Lominitz, but also just to casually warn him about Chevalier's guy, Eltonton. And this ended up being a big mistake. Oppenheimer's trying to look like a goody-goody boy and an anti-communist, and by doing so, he exposes himself politically more than he ever was. But a crazy detail about the scene, notice the desk lamp. When Oppie returns the next morning, the lamp has been swapped out with a new lamp, now that Colonel Pash has joined them. They swapped the lamp because this one has a listening device in it. And throughout the scene, you can notice Johnson shifting around it, and at one point he reaches beneath the desk and you know he's turning it on. We see them installing this listening device later, with Pash sitting in the background, when this recording comes back to haunt Oppenheimer later during the Q clearance hearing. Now, casting Casey Affleck as Pash is such a good move, not just because he's like an A-lister to hold our attention through a procedural, but necessary sequence to establish how Oppenheimer stepped in shit by trying to give them Eltonton without giving them his friend Chevalier. Casey Affleck brings a quiet intensity to the role of Pash, and lets Matt Damon, as Leslie Gross in the other scene, talk about Pash's violent reputation. Matt Damon and Casey Affleck were buddies in Goodwill Hunting, bragging about each other's rap sheets, so we keep waiting to see a cutaway of Casey Affleck torturing someone, but instead, we stay trapped in Oppie's point of view in this room with this quiet psychopath. Back in 1954, Pash reveals that he was transferred to London by Groves, and Oppie, in the background, looks surprised. He is just learning this now. How much Groves saved his ass during this period. So at the Christmas party, Oppenheimer is paranoid about Tolman suddenly missing. Tolman's been away. Where? Ruth won't tell. Yes, J. Robert Oppenheimer also had an affair with Tolman's wife, Ruth Tolman. And remember that name, Tolman? That's terrible, because earlier, Groves said that Tolman was the only person who said anything nice about Oppenheimer. It's like Oppenheimer was determined to make the one guy who thought he had integrity hate him like everyone else does. I think Carl Jung might have been right about humanity's self-destructive tendencies. But Groves delivers a Christmas present. They extracted Nils Bohr, who made it out of Nazi-occupied Denmark. Bohr informs them about Heisenberg leading the German bomb project, he seemed more focused on heavy water. As a moderator? Yes, instead of graphite. He took a wrong turn. This really cinched their victory over Germany, because graphite is really what's best to moderate a nuclear reaction, not heavy water. And Bohr warns Oppie about how the bomb will change the world after the war is over. You are an American Prometheus, the man who gave them the power to destroy themselves and they'll respect that. Christopher Nolan works in a reference to the Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin biography, but if Oppie knows his mythology in this moment, he knows the punishment that Prometheus suffered also awaits him. Being compared to one of the most tortured figures in mythological history by his academic hero coincides with Oppie getting the call about Gene Tatlock's death. He tells Kitty how they found an unsigned note, and Christopher Nolan includes one shot of her letter with the cursive trailing off as if written by someone fading from an overdose. And then, of course, the alternate theory of the black gloved hands drowning Gene Tatlock. But one detail I just noticed these hands and the wrists look a bit slender as they pull up from her neck, like a woman's hands. Maybe these hypothetical government agents would have used a female assassin so that the note would have female handwriting. Or maybe Christopher Nolan could have gotten real layered with this one. And in Oppie's imagination, it was Kitty who drowned Jean, and they might have even used Emily Blunt for the stake. I realize that theory is a bit of a reach, and theory only gets you so far. But it is Kitty whom Oppenheimer is most afraid of. You don't get to commit the sin, and then I was all feel sorry for you that it had consequences. Cerber argues with Lily Hornig about what the radiation could do to the female reproductive system. Your reproductive system is more exposed than mine, presumably. Hmm. Presumably saying that he's got a bit more of a little boy than a fat man there. Beta accuses Teller of stalling on the implosion calculations. The British can do it, Fuchs. Absolutely. Remember, Fuchs is the spy. So later, when Teller doesn't fully support Oppenheimer as worthy of security clearance renewal, really it was Teller who gave this spy what the spy would pass on to the Soviets. Fuchs 
You take Teller's role, I'm putting you exclusively on the implosion device. Back in 1949, now from Oppie's point of view, and I love how Nolan shows this with this bright, bright floral arrangement to remind us where we are. Like anytime we cut back here, the floral arrangement is being moved so we see who is at the table in this kind of like humorous Arrested Development gag kind of way. Hey, there's actually more people sitting here than we realized, and it's Nichols in this case. Later on, Nolan will do this in a scene with Nichols and Borden, and the camera turns around and hey, Strauss is also there. But in this scene, Robbie uses a compass to draw the widened blast radius of a hydrogen bomb, and the stomping sound comes back. You, you drown in 10 feet of water or, or 10,000, well, what's the difference? We can already drown. They know. They know. They know. They know. Hmm. The word drown, as Oppie's feeling like he is drowning in the stomping. And we see the stomping origin here because now in 1949, for Oppie, this would have been a memory from four years prior in 1945. During the scene, Oppie sees water rippling on this map of world cities as he mentally connects his pond ripples to the fire that could drown millions in an instant. Oppie meets William Borden, David Desmalchian, who shares a memory of being a pilot in World War II and seeing V-2 rockets headed for England, worried about an enemy rocket carrying an atomic warhead. Let's make sure we're not the ones to make that possible. Borden is not comforted here, and I think it's because he wanted Oppenheimer's answer to be, let's make sure we build these rockets first. And it's this moment where Borden never trusts Oppenheimer from here forward. Back at Los Alamos in April 1945, shortly after Hitler's death, group discussions are now led by Lily Hornig, joined by others like Philip Morrison, about discontinuing their work. In real life, Hornig did sign a petition to demonstrate the bomb on an uninhabited island, and she ended up living until 2017. Oppie counters that as theorists, they can imagine the horrifying future of their work, but that for every everyone else they have to convince. They won't fear it until they understand it, and they won't understand it until they've used it. And he says that collective fear could lead to international peace. You know, it's hard to know if Oppenheimer really believes that here, or if he's really just telling them this to keep these colleagues from getting locked up for treason. So they test the dynamite charges that would be surrounding the core, and Groves orders the test date in July to line up with the president meeting with Stalin at Potsdam, and he asks Oppenheimer what they should call this test. Better my heart. Three-person God. Trinity. So this is a quote from a devotional poem by John Donne, and this is the origin of the codename Trinity, which is sourced from a 1962 letter sent from Oppenheimer to Groves. It said, I did suggest it. Why I chose the name is not clear, but I know what thoughts were in my mind. There is a poem of John Donne, written just before his death, which I know and love. From it, a quotation, as east and west in all flat maps, and I am one, are one. So death doth touch the resurrection. In another better known devotional poem, Donne opens, Batter my heart, three-personed God. And according to Greg Herkin's 2002 book, Brotherhood of the Bomb, it was Gene Tatlock who introduced Oppenheimer to the poetry of John Donne, and Oppenheimer might have named it Trinity as a tribute to Gene. Roger Robb criticizes Oppenheimer for bringing in his commie brother Frank to help survey the land. And you felt your judgment was sound on who on the team could be trusted. Folks, head down. And after Rob brings up the spy at Los Alamos, we cut to the spy, Fuchs, being told to put his head down because this spy wanted to see the device with his own eyes so that he could report to the Soviets what this implosion device would look like. Okay, moving on to Washington, Secretary of War Stimson discusses the Tokyo firebombs that killed 100,000 Japanese, mostly civilians, and Fermi says, The A-bomb might not cause as much damage as the Tokyo bombings. And then notice how Lawrence pats his leg just to shut him up because he knows that this will just confuse the politicians in the room who might now think, well, do we have to drop two or three of these things then? So Oppenheimer describes how one device can emit a pillar of fire 10,000 feet tall, deadly neutrons in a mile radius. The atomic bomb will be a terrible revelation of divine power. Divine power, as in Prometheus stealing fire from the gods. And Secretary Stimson takes a possible target off the list. I've taken Kyoto off the list due to its cultural significance to the Japanese people. Also, my wife and I honeymooned there. This is actually one of the most controversial lines in the film because actor James Remar actually improvised the bit about Stimson honeymooning to Kyoto. It is not true that Stimson honeymooned there. He did visit the city in 1926. So you'll notice at this point, Christopher Nolan has stopped jumping around at different timelines and he just stays in Los Alamos in July 1945 up until the blast of the Trinity test, up through the actual bombings in August and the aftermath of it. It's because Christopher Nolan knows that this is really the most like straightforward cinematic part of the movie and he doesn't want to lose the audience by jumping away from it. So the gadget is installed in the tower and rigged with charges, and Oppenheimer tells Kitty, I'll send a message. It's gone our way. Take in the sheets. 
Yeah. So he says take in the sheets, not just as a random code phrase, but also take them in so that they don't collect radiation from the fallout. The Making Up documentary reveals that they actually used Kitty and Robert's actual house in New Mexico for these scenes. There's a last minute storm, but Oppenheimer, who grew up in New Mexico, is confident that it will break before dawn. But as they waited out, Groves asked Oppenheimer about those side bets that the scientists were placing on atmospheric ignition. Are we saying there's a chance that when we push that button, we destroy the world. Chances are near zero. Near zero. Guess Oppenheimer waited to tell Groves this part of the science until they had to go forward with the test. It was unavoidable. Teller smears sunscreen on his face while Feynman turns down a welder's glass to look through. The glass stops the UV. But stops the glass. So Feynman, who would later become kind of a rock star physicist in his own right, was reportedly one of the few in attendance who saw the blast without any eye covering. Teller, though, is always thinking about the greater destructive impact beyond the step everyone else is currently on. Like this guy's thinking full fusion and hydrogen at this point. And he's just like, hey, this could be a 10 kiloton blast or like a 100 kiloton blast. I'm putting on sunscreen. Ludwig Göransson scores the buildup with these frantic violin strings and Brainbridge confirms. But I love that his voice is drowned out by the string as Oppenheimer barely heard him because his anxiety and his anticipation is overwhelming him in this moment. We see a quick series of cuts where Bainbridge's fingers are trembling like crazy over the button and then flinches and pulls back the hand before settling it in four, three, two. One. And I always love it when screenplay documents perfectly structure the pages so that you turn the page right on the moment you're holding your breath. And I just got to take you through Nolan's verbal descriptions of this one page on 132. My breath stops an agonizing instant before silent light, full bright noon, sunny daylight. Robbie sees sudden daytime, turns to the light, peers through the welder's glass at blinding, silent white. Lawrence is stepping out of the car as Feynman shuts his eyes against instant daylight, a hushed intake of breath from the crowd of sunglasses clad distant observers. All we can hear is my tremulous breathing as the light becomes less blinding, resolving into a fireball, bright as the sun, but giant. I yank off my goggles, watch the boiling plasma become more visible in its hell contortions climbing into the sky like the devil's claw. My pupils are pinpricks. I just love the phrase devil's claw. Christopher Nolan insisted on shooting this detonation as practically and as without VFX as possible. Special effects supervisor Scott Fisher said that they built scale models of the tower and of the explosions, but didn't call these miniatures. They called them bigatures. They wanted to reduce the scale to a manageable size, but still get them as large as possible. So to create this practical explosion, they ignited drums of gas gasoline, and then two tenths of a second later, aluminum powder for the flash, and then shortly after that, mortars with gasoline, diesel, and black powder to push the explosion upward into a mushroom cloud shape. Ultimately, Nolan did admit that they did some digital compositing for the shot, but not much. And yeah, some viewers of this movie reported feeling underwhelmed by this explosion, specifically this shot from Lawrence's perspective. Now, this would be at the most distant observation point, so the fireball would be miles high, but because Christopher Nolan quick cuts from Oppenheimer, who would be much closer, it's kind of hard for the viewer to process that scale. The better shot, I think, is at the base camp with Groves, but Nolan doesn't linger on that shot for too long, and I think he does that on purpose. Really, decades of pop culture boom booms have conditioned audiences into seeing sweeping, towering CGI mushroom clouds in films over cities and horizons where we can process the scale, like Dr. Strangelove, Terminator 2, True Lies, The Sum of All Fears, The Wolverine, and even Christopher Nolan's own The Dark Knight Rises. Indeed, Christopher Nolan has some blood on his hands there. You can actually go online and and find various VFX animated re-renderings of Nolan's shot in Oppenheimer using actual footage from the real-life Trinity test, and some say that they would have preferred that, but to me, I think it works better the way Nolan shot it. The debate over it really recalls Spike Lee's criticism that the Oppenheimer film should have shown the actual bombings and the devastation of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, because why would you make a movie about Oppenheimer and not linger on the actual impact and shock people on what actually happened? It's an argument that I understand completely, but also, this is not a documentary. That is not the story Christopher Nolan is telling with this film. By withholding a master shot of the visual spectacle of the Trinity test, Christopher Nolan grounds us within Oppenheimer's perspective. Because think about it, terror as a concept is not a beautiful Steven Spielberg glory shot. Terror is a chaotic flurry of just being blinded in the moment and not knowing where to look. What makes this scene great is not the visual spectacle of it. It's not a shot that like John Ford would approve of. It's Oppenheimer's shaken reaction 
reaction to it all, the silence except his breathing, and the helplessness that this edit makes us feel. And yes, really, this whole moment is defined by what we hear and what we don't hear. And aside from the silence, this is all Oppenheimer says. And now I am become death. Destroyer of worlds. Yes, this is Oppenheimer repeating the words from the Bhagavad Gita, which he will later echo in his life in 1965 in his televised address. But remember, given the context in which Gene Tatlock first had him translate that Sanskrit, isn't there kind of a gross climactic eureka implied upon his witnessing of this explosion as an eruption after a long buildup? A test with a name that was inspired by a poem that Gene Tatlock introduced him to? But the silence is eventually broken by three bangs, and each of them are felt at different distances. <laughs> On the script page, Nolan textualizes these as crack, followed by three groupings of exclamation points. So Oppie tells Server to call Kitty. I love this transition because Oppenheimer's infant daughter is screaming over the cheering while his son plugs his ears. It's kind of like the scream of Nolan's own daughter that interrupts the cheering in the upcoming Fuller Lodge scene. Now, at this point of the film, we have stayed so long in Oppenheimer's point of view at Los Alamos with the devices that it kind of feels strange to watch the fat man and the little boy crated up and hauled out of the movie. Other historical films would follow the bomb all the way to its target, but J. Robert Oppenheimer never actually witnessed these bombings, so neither do we. We just hear President Truman's radio address. And they actually had Gary Oldman reread Truman's actual address. So the stomping we've been hearing throughout the movie finally reaches their origin in the Fuller Lodge sequence. And think about it, these would be the loudest sounds Oppenheimer would hear on August 9th, 1945. The stomps and the shouts that he will forever associate with the people who died on that day. Oppenheimer says, But I'll bet the Japanese didn't like it. Oof, the woman in the red dress mouths, woo, but we hear a little girl scream. And now silence overtakes the room, as Oppenheimer actually did in his speech. He says that he wishes they had it in time to use against the Germans, which now seems like an easy applause line that Oppenheimer uses to try to turn the sound back on in his head, but it does not work. It just gets worse. A flash of white fills the room, and bam, Christopher Nolan includes a close-up of his own daughter, Flora Nolan, with her skin peeling off. As I said at the top of this analysis, this is a deeply personal story for Christopher Nolan. He told The Telegraph, quote, if you create the ultimate destructive power, it will also destroy those who are near and dear to you. I suppose this was my way of expressing that in what, to me, were the strongest possible terms. Before Oppenheimer realizes it, he's now just suddenly walking through the crowd, suggesting that he blacked out for the ending of his speech. He hallucinates stepping in a charred corpse. He sees a couple making out under the bleachers, an indicator of the baby boom that the United States would soon be going through after the war. There's a blonde woman in the stands who was laughing uncontrollably before, but now when he looks at her, is sobbing hysterically. And and Oppenheimer passes a guy outside who's vomiting, and we don't know if it's from drinking too much because we saw liquor being passed around, or if it could be Oppie hallucinating someone with radiation sickness. So months after this, Oppenheimer meets President Truman in the White House, which occurred in October 1945. This actually would have been after Oppenheimer saw Serber and Morrison's slideshows of the imagery that they took at the bomb sites. So I love the attention to detail in this Oval Office set. Truman's desk is not the ornate Resolute desk made from the wood from the HMS Resolute from Queen Victoria that was installed in the Oval by Jackie Kennedy and used to this day, but it's actually the planar Hoover desk that was there during the administrations of Herbert Hoover and Franklin Roosevelt. So Oppenheimer annoys Truman right from the start. What we did at Hiroshima was... In Nagasaki. Obviously. Yes, Oppie doesn't want Truman to minimize the fact that there were two cities that were flattened. Truman asks Oppenheimer what they should do with the Los Alamos site. Give it back to the Indians. So in the script, Truman was supposed to laugh at this moment and then realize that Oppenheimer wasn't joking. But I like that Chris Nolan used this particular take from Gary Oldman, because this way we wouldn't get any of the annoying accidental laughs in movie theaters that would like be laughing along with Gary Oldman. So the camera now pushes in on Oppie's haunted eyes. I feel that I have blood on my hands. And Truman mocks him by waving a tissue in his face. So we learn the real source of Truman's hostility. He's jealous that Oppenheimer got on the cover of Time and is now getting credit for the bomb instead of Truman getting that credit. This is really what awaits Oppie at this point in his life after the Manhattan Project, scheming politicians like Harry Truman and Louis Strauss trying to take credit for something he ultimately does not want any credit for. As he leaves, Truman says, Don't let that crybaby back in here. Now, Nolan stages this moment so that the quote comes 
comes after Oppenheimer leaves the Oval, because Truman did historically refer to Oppie as a quote, crybaby scientist, but privately to an aide, not within Oppie's presence. And later, he actually told Secretary of State Dean Ackeson, I don't want to see that son of a bitch in this office ever again. So now, after an hour of the film's runtime being in color, within Oppie's perspective, we shift back to black and white for Strauss's perspective, as Oppenheimer is now depicted as a fame seeker, marveling at his own photo on the cover of Life. Whereas within Oppie's reality, he turned away from that Time Magazine photo as he was leaving the Oval. This stuff freaked him out in reality. Oppenheimer meets Ruth Tolman, wife to the now late Richard Tolman. Remember, this was the other affair that Oppie had on the side, despite Richard being the one physicist to say anything nice about Oppenheimer to Groves. This is at Louis Strauss' birthday party, and I love the attention to detail because Strauss's birthday was January 31st, and it was on January 31st, 1950, when Truman announced the H-bomb program moving forward. Strauss tries to introduce his son and his son's fiance to the father of the atomic bomb, and Oppie rudely waves them off, which Strauss views as a slight, confirming his paranoia about Einstein's flyby. But Strauss would have no idea how disgusted Oppie would be by that phrase after that Truman meeting and seeing it captioned on the magazine cover. Strauss tells Oppie that Fuchs was the spy, and that leads to this period of FBI surveillance and scrutiny of Oppenheimer speaking out. America and Russia may be likened to two scorpions in a bottle. So this speech would have been given in July 1953 and would have been one of the final speeches as a government official before losing his Q clearance. We see Oppie attending a lecture by Serber and Morrison who had visited the bombing sites in Japan. The uh, Japanese spoke of people who or striped clothing upon whom the skin was burned in stripes. This is a true detail, and for Oppenheimer, a particularly chilling one. He got into all of this because of what Hitler was doing to European Jews, including putting them in humiliating striped uniforms. Now, his actions permanently burn stripes onto the skin of Japanese civilians. Teller complains how some British scientists said that the bombings were not the last act of World War II, but really the first act of a Cold War with Russia, and he cites it to who? Patrick Black. It. And Oppie remembers his salty Cambridge professor biting an apple, probably wishing, damn, maybe I should have let him eat a poison one. While it was a 1945 Time magazine that was Oppie's nagging undoing, now it's a 1958 Time magazine that's a smoking gun for Strauss. The Senate aide reads the quote, fought Oppenheimer in the US-1, which Strauss had pitched as an angle the day before, which confirms that Strauss has been manipulating all sides of this. It was Strauss who choreographed Nichols to not let Oppenheimer keep a copy of the report, that denied his clearance renewal, and that Oppie would only get one if he appealed it, which forced Oppie into this rigged hearing. Roger Robb and the board could refuse to share the patch recording, since this isn't technically a criminal prosecution, it's just a matter of national security. Can we hear this recording? You don't have the clearance, Mr. Garris. But you're reading it into the record. Please, please. Is this proceeding interested in entrapment? Yeah, notice that additional glance that Jason Clark as Roger Robb gives to Oppenheimer. This is why every actor being a heavy hitter pays off in this movie. The whole point of this legal nonsense is just to prod Oppenheimer into an outburst just like this. And really, that was the point of many of the communist witch trials in the 1950s. Robbie defends Oppie at the hearing, but apparently Strauss told Lawrence about the affair with Ruth Tolman. And when Lawrence arrives to testify against Oppenheimer, Robbie just stares him down like a mother saying, don't you dare hurt my boy. But it's not enough. Rob brings in Borden to read his damning letter, and Oppie sees a stenographer tapping it into the transcript, the fingers drumming just like the stamping feet, and Oppenheimer laments. Is anyone ever going to tell the truth about what's happening here? But history provides an answer. Dr. David Hill in 1958, who drops a David H-bomb on Strauss. The Oppenheimer matter was initiated and carried through largely through the animus of Louis Strauss. So despite Oppenheimer swatting Hill's pen, refusing to sign his and Zillard's petition, never even knowing who he was beyond the name Glasses, according to the script, all of these scientists collectively know that Oppenheimer over these years has tortured himself enough to not deserve this public martyrdom to benefit the political rise of some asshole. And I love this detail. Notice that from the first day of Louis Strauss's hearing to now with Dr. Hill, the audience in the room has grown considerably larger. While Kitty resents Oppenheimer for his affairs, of course, she hates his craven political foes even more. And I believed this since I left the party 16 years ago. But 17 years ago. My mistake. 
but you saw Sorry, 18. Yeah, she's totally toying with Rob just to piss him off. And by counting up the numbers, she's kind of making it feel like this hearing alone has dragged on for a year. No, two years. No, three years. So the screenplay actually places Teller's testimony after Kitty's, which would then lead to Kitty snapping at Oppenheimer for shaking Teller's hand, saying that she would have spat in his face. But editing it the way it is makes it so that Kitty's testimony is last, resulting in this next scene hitting differently. Why put yourself through more of it? I have my reasons. Yeah, Abby's real reasons are, at least in part, to fix his relationship with Kitty because Kitty won't let him back down. Also, of course, the fact that he hopes that being a martyr will be some self-punishment that he deserves and that history may finally forgive him. So Roger Robb's final interrogation crescendos into a fiery rage as the room fills with light of a nuclear blast, but a blast that only Oppenheimer can see because he's the only man in the room properly worried about it. And Oppenheimer is so distracted by this, he ends up making Robb's point. If we did it, they would have to do it. Our efforts would only fuel their efforts just as it had with the atomic bomb. Yes, Roger Robb says, no moral scruples in 1945, plenty in 1949. And Gray, played by the wonderful Tony Goldwyn, calmly asks, really, what is the big question in this movie? Dr. Oppenheimer, when did your strong moral convictions develop with respect to the hydrogen bomb? And Oppenheimer gives us an unsatisfying answer when it became clear to me that we would tend to use any weapon we had. So we, the viewer, no doubts were felt in fall 1945 when he saw the bomb impact photos and when he talked to Truman. But what was the inflection point before 1949? It was the big scene of this movie, 1947, right in the middle. Whatever he and Einstein discussed. The big mystery that Strauss reminds us about in his montage. And the aide even teased him up before he releases Strauss to the wolves. Is it possible? They didn't talk about you at all. It's possible they spoke about something uh, more important. So Oppie is denied his clearance in 1954. Strauss is denied by the Senate in 1958. There were apparently three holdouts led by this guy. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy. Actually, the other two Democrats who voted against Strauss also sought the presidential nomination, Lyndon B. Johnson and Hubert Humphrey. All three wanted to score some political points by dogpiling on the asshole who went after a national hero and a peace preacher. Kennedy, of course, would later steer the country through the Cuban Missile Crisis, and it is LBJ at the end of the movie who gives Oppenheimer the Fermi Award in December 1963. That was literal weeks after Kennedy was assassinated. So this movie circles back to the pond. We're finally gonna get our answers. Einstein foretells Oppenheimer's future at the White House in 1963. I'll turn the back, tell you all is forgiven. Just remember, it won't be for you, it will be for them. So Teller's advancement of the hydrogen bomb and his failure to fully defend Oppenheimer in 1954 gets him this icy response from Kitty. It would be Teller's fusion that would dominate the 20th century from here on out. And while Oppenheimer is polite, Kitty knows as someone who shares a bed with Robert how haunted he is every night. So as we see Strauss approaching in the distance, Christopher Nolan finally delivers this movie's rosebud. We thought we might start a chain reaction that would destroy the entire world. I remember it well, both of it. I believe we did. He says, we did. Not I did, we did. If Einstein had felt any relief in his later years that maybe Oppenheimer would now be the sole sin eater for taking Einstein's research too far, no, no, no. Oppenheimer drags the old man back down with him into his quantum pit of despair. With four words, he incepts the idea. We open this Pandora's box together, my friend. We've both stolen fire from the gods, and both of us will now have to torture ourselves for eternity. The haunted look that Oppenheimer has been walking around with his entire life is now etched upon upon Einstein's face. Oppenheimer annihilated any good mood Einstein might have for his remaining years, depriving Strauss of a daily Princeton passing hello from the great Albert Einstein and cursing Strauss to dedicating his life and ruining Oppenheimer for whatever happened in that conversation. And thus, whatever Oppenheimer sees in these final images, we have to imagine Einstein is seen as well. Rows and rows of ICBMs, rockets breaking through the clouds, rockets soaring over his head from Borden's cockpit. But whereas Borden just saw one before before, now Oppie sees dozens of them, the world on fire. From space, flaming ripples erupting on the surface in a chain reaction, the atmosphere igniting, starting with North America. Oppie is back to the dread that he felt upon seeing mere ripples in a puddle of water at Cambridge. But now, instead of abstract particles that his mind goes to, he sees a very, very real, tangible apocalypse. And the only thing he can do to spare himself and us this ongoing dread is the one fight or flight response response he had as a schoolboy. Close the box, snuff the fire stolen from the gods, and jam 
the eyes shut. So what does Christopher Nolan shut his eyes to? What chain reaction did he start that set the world on fire? Why is the story of Oppenheimer something that is so close and personal to something that Christopher Nolan has gone through in his life and career? Well, think about it. If J. Robert Oppenheimer's inventions concerned nuclear fission, Christopher Nolan's inventions obviously concern the process of filmmaking. So what inflection point, what Pandora's box has been to Hollywood with the atomic bomb was to geopolitics and humankind? The advent of the talkie with the jazz singer yeah. The arrival of summer blockbusters with Jaws? Definitely. The VFX revolution with Jurassic Park? Yeah, I would say so. But Christopher Nolan's contribution to that chain reaction? Comic book movies as billion dollar tent poles. Yes, Christopher Nolan's Trinity test was The Dark Knight. A historic, groundbreaking, amazing accomplishment that required immense effort and changed the game for so many. Sure, superhero movies as big blockbusters did not begin with Christopher Nolan, like Richard Donner's Superman, Tim Burton's Batman, Sam Raimi's Spider-Man. These were all record-breaking earners. But The Dark Knight in 2008 was the first time a comic superhero movie made a billion dollars. That was the film that gave Christopher Nolan a blank check and director's cut for the rest of his career. And it arrived at the same inflection point year of the launch of Marvel Studios in summer 2008. And ever since, all the big studios, Warner Brothers, Disney, Sony, Fox, before Disney bought it, they have all been in an arms race for the next billion dollar superhero blockbuster. And meanwhile, this race and then the streaming wars they then got locked into caused the studio slates to include fewer and fewer films not based on any major IP. And now those are the only types of movies Christopher Nolan seems to want Want to make now. Now, sure, I don't think Christopher Nolan wakes up every day regretting The Dark Knight because it led to Madame Web. Christopher Nolan probably feels proud of the movie and he deserves to. It was an amazing film. But I think he would agree that Hollywood, the studios, all learned the wrong lessons from what he accomplished with The Dark Knight. And I just think it's very revealing that with Oppenheimer, Christopher Nolan insisted on doing everything practically, even when it would lead to a lesser boom. He made a movie as long as Avengers Endgame, but made it as a historical drama with artsy memento style color effects and still made nearly a billion dollars with it and then swept the Oscars and he did all this with Iron Man. Oppenheimer is Christopher Nolan trying to fix everything film lovers have hated about Hollywood since 2008. So I'll leave you with this. One burden of all creators, honestly, is success. Something you make taking off, generating money or power or influence for entities you didn't anticipate, reaching corners of the world and the internet you never knew existed, and yet your name always being attached to it and being blamed when future generations curse its existence. And after, what has it been, eight years of making YouTube film analysis content, I wondered if the videos we would make would form a chain reaction that would make thumbnails stupider and theories more outlandish and media literacy even more diminished. And sometimes I believe we did.